Uh, all right, joining us now, uh, we uh, we weren't expecting to have him, but uh, um, kind enough to uh, answer the call. We sent up the signal. <laughs> and he answers. When uh, the Chicago Bears fired their offensive coordinator, Shane Waldron, earlier uh, on Tuesday. Tom Pelissero here um, on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, that's 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 uh, sincere applause, Tom. <laughs> sincere applause for you. I'm, I'm always happy to answer. Sometimes I got to jump out of the shower to answer your call, Rich, but I always always get there. There, ladies and gentlemen. Painting word pictures. The hair's always proper, though, Rich. Yeah. So it's not like you were catching them off guard. Ever, that's true. You know, Tom Pelissero, sir. Why now for Shane Waldron and the Bears to part ways, sir? The simplest explanation, Rich, is they just weren't good enough the last couple of weeks. Obviously, you heard it from the fans, the booze being out in the first half and and all that. They, they just they didn't score enough. And when you've got the expectations they have, when you've put so many resources into um, the offense and adding personnel and adding the receivers and you use the number one overall pick on Caleb Williams, you know, the bar is set at a certain level and they were always going to have the challenge of being able to meet that bar. You know, I, I still go back a few weeks to the fact that they've got the commanders beat in Washington until Tyreek Stevenson decides to wave goodbye to the crowd and then tips the ball to uh, Noah Brown in the back of the end zone and they lose that game. You know, the last two weeks going to Arizona, I think they scored nine points in that game and then three against the Patriots. You know, clearly something had to change. And it was a I would tell you this, Rich, it was a unique sequence of events because, um, you know, Matt Eberflus goes, he says, I think on the radio yesterday morning that they're talking about changes, and then he does his press conference in the afternoon. He won't commit to Shane Waldron still being on staff uh, as the offensive coordinator by the following week. My understanding as of last night was that the plan was going to be Waldron would stay. They potentially would move him upstairs, um, you know, change some things operationally, but that he was going to remain the offensive coordinator. But Shane Waldron got called in by Matt Eberflus around 730 Central this morning and told that they were indeed going to make a change. They had a staff meeting at eight. Everybody found out it's going to be Thomas Brown now taking over. As the offensive coordinator, it's a big opportunity uh, for Thomas Brown, who last year, remember, he took over. Frank Wright gave him play calling duties, then took him back. Then Wright got fired. Then Thomas Brown took over again. He, he got some of the some of the same elements at play here, where you're trying to rescue Caleb Williams, who's just been more up and down than they would like through the course this year. I think the biggest difference. I know we talked about this the other day. Is you've you've seen it with Caleb. You've seen him make some big plays. They're just not happening consistently enough. He's taken way too many sacks. You're hoping that a different energy level, somebody new calling the plays from the, the same offense, maybe that's that's going to make a difference, and it comes at a really critical juncture for the Bears. They get set to uh, play the oldest rivalry in the league this weekend against the Packers. Well, before we, we move forward, um, you, there, there's, there's still a question about what happened to get us to this point. Tom, that I'd, I'd like to ask you about. Cliff Kingsbury was there for the Bears to hire. They did interview him in January, unless there's something behind the scenes with Kingsbury and Caleb we didn't know about or anything like that. Um, and it, because, you know, with, with Kingsbury doing what he's doing right now with Jaden Daniels, just offsets even more, more, or I guess it spotlights even more the significance of the struggle for Chicago. Certainly, if they're now turning to a guy that was part of the offensive struggle last year that led to Caleb Williams even being able to be drafted by Chicago. So, my long-winded windup of saying, why why didn't the Bears hire Cliff Kingsbury when they had a chance, Tom? I believe the Bears interviewed nine people for their offensive coordinator job. The only second interview they did was with Shane Waldron. He came into Chicago uh, and they hired him. And, and this was somebody who had, you know, called plays, obviously, for a couple of years in Seattle. Always had a good reputation going back to his days uh, with the Rams. He had trained under Bill Belichick. He'd worked with different types of quarterbacks in different systems. And the belief for the Bears and for Matt Eberflus was that he was going to be able uh, – to run the right offense to get Caleb Williams going where he wanted to go. With Cliff, you know, he interviewed for at least three jobs because he also, of course, interviewed for the Raiders job, left the building. The Raiders thought that they were getting him as the offensive coordinator, then woke up the next day. There had been a, an issue in the negotiations, and Cliff ends up in Washington. Now, I, I don't know that when Cliff was, was hired – 
the people were necessarily celebrating that either in Washington, because the last impressions you had of Cliff Kingsbury was Kyler Murray screaming at him on the sideline and, you know, kind of where things have been in Arizona uh, down the stretch of, uh, you know, of his tenure there, but caught the right, you know, end up in the right situation with the right quarterback in Jaden Daniels, who honestly came in probably being more pro ready than Caleb Williams, just because of the way that he had played from the pocket at LSU, because of the growth that he had done there, that's taken nothing away from cliff, but you know, he may have ended up with the quarterback who was a little bit closer uh, to being ready to function at a high level in the NFL. I, I do think that, you know, given the totality of this, given the history of, you know, Caleb Williams and Cliff Kingsbury having a pre-existing relationship, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, we're having this conversation again somewhere down the line, depending where this Bears uh, season ends up going about whether or not Cliff Kingsbury in a different capacity hmm. uh, could end up in Chicago. But but at that time, you know, the thinking was Shane Waldron, based on his history, the different styles of quarterbacks he had worked with, and what they wanted to get out of Caleb, they believed that that was the right fit. Shane's a great guy. He's a good football coach. It just was not working in Chicago. I think that everybody understood that. And again, even though last night it seemed like Shane Waldron was going to be sticking around, you can understand why Matt Eberflus decided he needed to make the move this morning. No question, Tom. So so, um, Thomas Brown, you want to give us a primer and also what his skill set uh, being brought to bear makes the Bears think that he can do something different than Shane Waldron with the result? Yeah, Thomas Brown is, is definitely a different uh, type of a personality than Shane Waldron. Shane's, um, I don't necessarily want to call him introverted, but he's, he's very thoughtful. Um, you know, with Thomas Brown, not that he's not a thoughtful guy, but he is high energy and going to, you know, get, bring some juice to the room, Sean McVay, you know, was called him one of the greatest competitors that he'd ever been around. He was the assistant head coach on the Rams team that won the Super Bowl. Again, there were a lot of things that didn't work last year in Carolina. They had the idea, let's bring in a bunch of different people from different backgrounds and have a mind meld. And instead, they just ended up with, you know, no identity on offense. But Thomas Brown's interviewed for a bunch of head coaching jobs in the past. Um, he's going to be able to communicate probably a little bit differently with Caleb Williams. We'll see where he ends up calling the place from. He's been in the booth but I believe that it's possible he may end up on the sideline and being able to be face to face uh, with Caleb Williams uh, in the course of the game. He, he's very highly thought of within the league. His background, he was a former NFL running back. He was drafted out of Georgia, uh, suffered a, an injury, blew out. I believe he tore his groin off the bone uh, when getting horse collar tackled in a preseason game. But went into coaching and has been you know, highly regarded since here. It's a, it's a huge opportunity for him at a time that everybody's trying to figure out who the, you know, the head coaching candidates are going to be this time around. See if you can catch lightning in a bottle. There's always a placebo effect when you change out the head coach or the quarterback or the offensive coordinator, you know, maybe you get a little bit of a bounce here and if they can go and steal one or at least look better this week in green Bay, then that's, um, you know, that's going to be progress. All right. Uh, in the couple of minutes I have left with you here before the end of our hour, you just chatted with Jake Ferguson for, for the insiders, Tom. We did have Jake Ferguson on uh, for the Insiders. I did ask him. I heard your conversation about the, uh, the sunshine yes, in uh, AT&T Stadium. <laughs> and I told him, you know, what? when I first got into TV, and Rich, you might have gotten this discussion uh, once upon a time, but I was told when you're when you're in a very sunny spot or when they really got to turn those lights up, you, you close your eyes and you look toward the lights. And then when you open your eyes, it's like fixed it. So I said, have you learned any tricks in your time in Dallas for catching the ball uh, in that, you know, when the sun's hitting the field and he, you know, he kind of deadpan, he just go, he goes, catch the black spot. In other words, look <laughs> oh. in the middle of the sun, the thing that's, that's it. That's the ball that's in there. He also pointed out on that play, you know, the focus has been on CD lamb, not seeing the ball at all. He goes, you can see right there. I actually should probably reach out and just catch it. Mm. Cause obviously Jake Ferguson crossing the goal line in front of him, he can see the ball, but he thinks the ball's coming to CD. So he pulls his hands back. I mean, there's a lot going on. Right now in Dallas, you just lost, lost Dak Prescott for the season. You're three and six. Your coaching staff is all in contract years. And oh, by the way, you're on national TV, Monday Night Football mm. uh, against the the Houston Texans. But you know, Ferguson said that they had discussions yesterday about what they you know what they need to do, the kind of the approach that they need to have to to go into this game. Cooper Rush is a guy. When you talk to anybody there, they'll all tell you that locker room has confidence in Cooper Rush. The stat line is 
unimaginably be unimaginably bad last week. I think he threw for what forty three or forty seven yards. I mean, it's it's almost impossible to do that. But based on what Cooper Rush has done in the past, he is a guy that they believe in. And I would not be surprised if in some capacity we see a little bit more of Trey Lance, even though the year and a half he's had in the system has not given them the feeling that he should be getting the nod as the starter over Cooper Rush. What do you mean you see like a package, a Trey Lance package in the same way we did when he was with Jimmy G coming out of college? Is that what you're saying? Definitely a possibility just because you know, I mean, Trey Lance does bring a, a little bit different skill set in terms of the mobility, what he can do outside the pocket, some of the run elements. The issues with Trey Lance have always been durability and accuracy. He's been hurt almost every time he's gotten a chance to play, and that's prevented him from making strides in terms of the accuracy, which also, of course, has a lot to do with how you're processing and how you're you're seeing things on the field. When he got into the game the other day, you probably saw some of the same types of things, but if there's you know different things they can do, if they can get creative and find ways to get him onto the field. I mean, you know, Rico Dow has run better. That might have been the best that he's looked this season, but they haven't really had a run game the entire season. You're, you're going to need all the offense that you can get. You're going to need all the creativity you can get going up against, you know, D'Amico Ryans and Matt Burke and that uh, Texans defense. I think it's going to be a fun game next Monday night. And for both these teams, probably Dallas more so than Houston, but for both these teams, this is going to feel like, you, you got to win this game or, you know, you're in a little bit of trouble here. Tom Pelissero, bless you for uh, taking the call and hopping on uh, when, uh, when asked. Greatly appreciate that. J.K. Simmons, the Academy Award winner, coming up. Still here on Roku. I got 90 seconds left. Is, is it possible Daniel Jones comes back from the bye from Germany and he's not the quarterback for the Giants, Tom, anymore? It, it certainly sounds possible, and those are things they're going to discuss. I know that you know certain people have made a lot of the the injury guarantee. That, that that's always applied. He could have gotten hurt any time in the last couple of months. Here, if Daniel Jones is not the starter coming out of the bye, it's because one, they feel like we need to get a longer look. We got to get a look at Drew Lock and get maybe another look at Tommy DeVito, and B. Because they just aren't playing well. They're not winning games with Daniel Jones. Yeah, you're seeing the fire and the physicality and all that stuff, but they're just not good enough right now. So, yes, that has the effect of preventing, what, $23 million in injury guarantees for becoming fully vested in 2024. But if they were, if that were their primary concern, they could have benched Daniel Jones a month ago. They haven't done that to this point. It certainly sounds like it's going to be a uh, conversation here. One way or another, it's hard to imagine Daniel Jones back in New York in 2024. But we'll see exactly what direction they want to go because I don't think it's a slam dunk, Rich, even if they make the change that it's Drew Locke because you can certainly argue the best football they've played over the last two seasons was when uh, Tommy, Tommy uh, DeVito was in the lineup. Yeah, Cutlets. Tom, thanks for the time. Greatly appreciate it, brother. You be well. You got it, Rich. Everybody too. check out Tom See Pelissero Tom, on Tony. NFL Plus right here on Roku on the Insiders along with NFL Network. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free.